We come now to the causal closure objection to substance dualism. In essence, this objection asserts that the physical universe is causally closed. If that is true, then there is no way for immaterial entities like souls to causally affect the physical world. As Jaguan Kim declares, Physicalists accept the causal closure of the physical not only as a fundamental metaphysical doctrine, but as an indispensable methodological presupposition of the physical sciences. And Anti Revansuo adds, The trouble is that the physical realm is causally closed, and, respectively, the non-physical realm is causally inert, at least with respect to the physical. The causal closure of the physical world means that physical events can only be causally influenced by other physical events, and are able to cause further events only of the purely physical kind, through mechanisms that are nothing but physical. The problem that the dualist faces is this. To causally interact with the physical realm, such as the brain, a thing needs to have at least some physical properties. The soul stuff, then, should have some physical properties after all, if it is to have any impact on our brain activity. But for the dualist, consciousness is, by definition, something non-physical. Now in the first place, and as I have repeatedly said throughout this video, if this objection works at all, it only applies to interactionist versions of dualism, leaving other versions untouched. Lawrence Bonjour makes this point, saying, The closure principle does not by itself entail that materialism is true. It leaves open both the possibility of non-material realms that are causally isolated from the material world, and also the possibility that epiphenomenalism is true, that conscious phenomena are side effects of material processes that are incapable of having any reciprocal influence on the material world. But leaving this point aside, we might begin by wondering why we should accept the premise that the physical world is causally closed in the first place. There must be an independent argument for this, since interactionist versions of dualism are predicated upon the idea that the physical world is not causally closed, but is rather open to the activities of immaterial minds, to simply take causal closure for granted is blatantly begging the question against dualism. Again, Bonjour correctly responds by saying, But why is the principle of causal closure itself supposed to be so obviously correct? Clearly this principle is not, and could not be, an empirical result. No empirical investigation that is at all feasible could ever establish that human bodies, the most likely locus of such external influence, are in fact never affected, even in small and subtle ways, by non-material causes. We are told that scientists accept this principle, and often that most philosophers accept it as well. But do they have any compelling reasons for such acceptance? Or is this vaunted principle nothing more than an unargued and undefended assumption, a kind of intellectual prejudice in the literal meaning of the word? Taken in the abstract, apart from any appeal to a specific account of conscious mental phenomenon, I have no idea whether the principle of causal closure is true or not. More importantly, I cannot imagine how to rationally decide whether it is true without first arriving at a defensible account of conscious mental states. It seems utterly obvious that mental states do causally affect the material realm, if a materialist account of conscious states is correct, then the principle of causal closure seems likely to be true. But if no such account is correct, then the principle is almost certainly false. Thus to argue for the truth of materialism, or for a strong presumption in favor of materialism, by appeal to the principle of causal closure, is putting the cart in quite a flagrant way before the horse. So by using the causal closure principle to argue for physicalism, the physicalist is effectively using the premise that the immaterial cannot affect the material to argue that the immaterial cannot affect the material, a paradigm example of a circular argument. 
But not only does asserting the causal closure principle without some sort of justification already beg the question against interactionist substance dualism, but it also apparently begs the question against most types of theism. For if the physical world is causally closed, then this also straightforwardly entails that God cannot act in the world. As Charles Taliaferro and Stuart Goetz observe, it is important to make clear that if the argument from causal closure is successful, it not only makes it impossible to explain some events in the physical world in terms of the causal activity of human souls and their purposes for acting, but also makes it impossible to explain other events in the physical world in terms of the causal activity of God and God's purposes for acting. Hence, a good argument is needed for the causal closure principle if this objection to dualism is going to avoid being entirely circular. Nevertheless, materialists like David Papineau attempt to assert that the causal closure principle is indeed supported by empirical evidence. Papineau tells us that the one assumption that I did expect to be uncontroversial was the completeness of physics. To my surprise, I discovered that a number of my philosophical colleagues didn't agree. They didn't see why some physical occurrences in our brain, perhaps, shouldn't have irreducibly conscious causes. Once I was forced to defend it, I realized that the completeness of physics is by no means self-evident. There is good empirical evidence for the completeness of physics, but the historical story shows that this evidence is relatively recent, and that prior to the 20th century, the empirical case for the completeness of physics was by no means persuasive. There is indeed a good case for materialism, but it has not always been available to philosophers. This is because its crucial premise, the completeness of physics, rests on empirical evidence which has emerged only relatively recently. But this is no defense of the closure principle. Papineau merely asserts that empirical evidence exists to support causal closure, but doesn't bother to tell us what that evidence might be. And in the very nature of the case, it's difficult to see how empirical evidence could establish causal closure even in principle. Empirical investigation, by the very nature of what it is, only examines physical causes and effects. But how could such an investigation ever rule out the presence of immaterial causes? It would seem that, at best, empirical investigation could only say that immaterial causes are unnecessary, but showing that they are unnecessary is a far cry from establishing that they are non-existent. As Matthew Owen responds, the majority of scientists consider it their job to find physical causes of physical phenomena. They try to do so via empirical observation. Most scientists do not see it as their job to identify non-physical causes. Therefore, it seems inconsequential if empirical investigations of scientists do not identify non-physical causes. After all, they are not investigating such causes, nor are they investigating whether they exist. Only if one presupposes physicalism, and thus that the physical sciences give an exhaustive account of the world, does it make sense to conclude that there are no non-physical causes because physical scientists have not identified them through their empirical investigations. Even if scientists were looking for non-physical causes, non-physical causes, if they exist, are most likely invisible and not observable by empirical investigation alone. The basic worry is that if there were an invisible non-physical co-cause of an event that was necessary, it could not be known merely on the basis of empirical investigation, nor could it be known that the empirically observable cause is not sufficient. For the empirically observed cause would appear to be the lone sufficient cause from the vantage point of empirical observation, whether or not it actually is. Proponents of the causal closure objection to dualism are also prone to conflating two different potential understandings of the causal closure principle. 
only a strong and empirically unjustified version of the principle actually conflicts with interactionist dualism. As Rob Coons and George Beeler point out, anti-materialism is alleged to be unable to accommodate the possibility of mental causation without violating the causal closure of the physical. But this is not at all clear when causal closure is formulated in its most plausible form as follows. For every physical event E that has a cause, there is a physical event C such that it is nomologically or causally necessary that if C occurs, E occurs. Suppose that physics requires and provides justification for this weak causal closure principle. But obviously this weak principle does not imply the following stronger closure principle. For every physical event E that has a cause, there is a physical event C such that C is a sufficient cause of E. Failure to appreciate the distinction between weak causal closure and strong closure principles has led many philosophers to the conclusion that mental causation is untenable in an anti-materialist setting, whereas, in fact, there are very promising accounts of mental causation compatible with anti-materialism. And yet again, the causal closure argument is reversible. It can just as easily be applied to the idea that we are composite physical objects. As Andrew Brenner explains, the idea is that the causal closure of the physical is no more plausible than the causal closure of the microphysical. In other words, every physical event which has a sufficient cause has a sufficient microphysical cause, and in particular, a sufficient cause in terms of the activities of some muriologically simple objects. So, any causal contribution made by a composite object would be overdetermined by the causal contributions of its muriologically simple parts. The standard example is that of a baseball breaking a window. If the baseball moving in such and such a direction with such and such a velocity relative to the window is sufficient to break the window, then the muriologically simple parts of the baseball moving in such and such a direction with such and such a velocity relative to the window is sufficient to break the window. So, barring overdetermination, the baseball does not break the window. If these were good grounds to eliminate souls from our ontology, then they would also be good grounds to eliminate composite objects from our ontology, including those composite physical objects with which we might be identical. If overdetermination arguments undermine substance dualism, then they undermine belief in composite physical persons as well. So with respect to concerns regarding causal overdetermination, there is a parity between belief in immaterial souls and belief in composite physical persons. To round out this section then, we have explored five different responses to the causal closure objection. First, I have noted that if the objection works at all, it can only apply to an interactionist type of dualism. Second, I have argued that the causal closure principle is unjustified and therefore begs the question against dualism. Third, I have contended that appeals to empirical evidence are both lacking and incapable of establishing causal closure even in principle. Fourth, I have pointed out that proponents of the causal closure objection are likely confusing two different ways of understanding the causal closure principle, and that the more plausible understanding is not actually incompatible with dualism. And finally, I have argued that the causal closure argument is completely reversible.